Uh, uh, I'd like to, so Nick has had to just pop off. So I wasn't expecting to do this and my brain fog will be kicking in. So next we've got uh, Dr. Jessica Eccles, who's going to be talking to us about brain fog uh, and POTS and long COVID, the causes and the management. I'll chat to you about mine later. Hello everyone, my name is uh, Jessica Eccles and I am a clinical senior lecturer at Brighton and Sussex Medical School where I have an interest in brain body interactions, particularly as they relate to hypermobility, which several people have already mentioned earlier today. And um, I have to um, give a bit of a disclaimer that essentially I am going to talk to you about learning uh, from research that we've already conducted on autonomic and inflammatory influences on mental fatigue from studies that I did before COVID in terms of how that might be relevant to some of the patients that we have been talking about today because of this overlap between long COVID, POTS, post-viral fatigue, MCAS, et cetera, et cetera. And in fact, the, the bulk of my uh, the advice is actually all of the advice that people have already given about how to treat POTS and MCAS and things like that. So um, uh, I, this is an outline of, of, of what we're going to talk about. And um, I'm going to introduce you to my interest in uh, chronic pain and fatigue. And basically, this is pre-COVID chronic pain and fatigue, but essentially I think there are many things going on, including dysautonomia, uh, connective tissue variants, small fiber neuropathy, mast cell activation, uh, and uh, dysregulated interceptive processes, all of which could uh, be uh, multidisciplinary treatment targets. And I've just uh, highlighted from this um, paper that we wrote about growing interest in dysautonomia in, and um, how uh, POTS and orthostatic intolerance are frequently found in fibromyalgia and MECFS. So uh, some years ago, uh, I secured some money from, uh, well, colleagues and I from Versus Arthritis to look into autonomic and inflammatory mechanisms of pain and fatigue in fibromyalgia. And we were uh, including patients with MECFS as a control, but I will, not as a control, but as a comparison as, as fatigue patients rather than pain patients. And we, um, these uh, participants underwent a autonomic challenge, which was tilt table, and an inflammatory challenge, which was typhoid vaccination. And um, they had various uh, tests along the way, including uh, gene expression, uh, inflammatory cytokines, and um, hypermobility assessments. So um, what we found was a third of the patients came to us with a diagnosis of fibromyalgia and a third with a diagnosis of MECFS, but in and third with a dual diagnosis, but... <laughs> In fact, and actually the, the results of this paper are available on the, on the QR code. And we were hoping that we would be able to compare the fibromyalgia patients with the MECFS patients. Um, but in fact, of this group of patients, 90% of them met diagnostic criteria for fibromyalgia and nearly 100% met diagnostic criteria for MECFS, indicating how difficult on research criteria it is to tease apart uh, patients with chronic pain and fatigue. But then most interestingly for me, uh, interested in hypermobility, that actually 81% um, of these patients met the old Brighton criteria for joint hypermobility syndrome. Um, and nearly 20% the HEVS criteria. This is a very uh, high uh, proportion. And interestingly, hypermobility, hypermobility um, characteristics correlated with fatigue, and we're talking about mental fatigue here as well, mental clutter um, and uh, pain, uh, um, uh, pain and disease. So it's been traditionally thought that MECFS and fibromyalgia are non-inflammatory, but there's a, growing, there's a gr growing evidence to suggest this is not the case. And we found uh, even correcting for BMI, which can have an effect on uh, inflammatory markers, that both um, uh, ESR and CRP were raised in patients compared to controls. But for the eagle-eyed amongst you, you can see that basically the patients have the lower level of normal and the controls are, are way below um, what we think of as normal. But why, why is this relevant to brain fog? I'm going to tell you in a minute. Um, 
uh, what we found was that baseline ESR level, and we excluded any patient that we thought had an acute phase response who had a white cell count greater than 10. Uh, we, um, it, baseline ESR significantly predicted fatigue severity and pain level, including uh, mental fatigue, so brain fog, and mental clutter. CRP significantly predicts fatigue severity and pain level. And really interestingly, uh, ESR mediates, so it's a mechanistic factor, uh, but, uh, the mechanistic factor, sorry, I've recently recovered from COVID and struggling, uh, uh, between being a patient and having, um, and your cognitive fatigue. So you're more likely to have higher levels of cognitive fatigue if you're a patient, and this is explained mathematically by your baseline inflammation. So what uh, the, the tilt table, which um, uh, Nick Ball talked to us about, and we've heard of all sorts of ingenious ways of mimicking a tilt table. We put patients on a tilt table and we uh, got them to uh, do some uh, tests uh, before and after. And what I want to show you is supine and whilst after they've been on tilt for eight minutes, um, is that uh, um, self-reported pain, increased on tilt in the patient, but not the controls, but there was no change in pain thresholds induced by tilt. So this is really interesting. So tilt is not making you more sensitive to pain, it is increasing the pain. And uh, fatigue level also uh, in patients, and this is exactly the same result for brain fog, for mental fatigue, which we also measured, is induced by tilt in patients with MECFS and fibromyalgia and not controls. So that's, that's interesting, but it's, it's just an observation. What could be the mechanisms behind this? And this is, this is where it gets really exciting. So this is doing something called a Hayes mediation analysis. And uh, the, these findings are actually available as an abstract online, but we hope to, to submit them for, as a preprint in the next couple of weeks, is that tilt-induced pain is mediated, so the mechanistic factor is the number of connective tissue features in the hypermobility diagnostic criteria, and tilt-induced fatigue mediated by baseline levels of inflammation. And what is, um, what is interesting is, I told you that we gave uh, patients a typhoid vaccination as an inflammatory challenge, we find uh, very similar findings in terms of inflammation-induced mental fatigue. So, sorry, I need some water. Valuable time, waste. You're okay, you're doing well for time. Um, hmm. So, we also did something quite exciting, uh, which is gene expression. Uh, so this is something called transcriptomics, it's where you look at messenger RNA, and you're not looking at what genes people have, uh, but you're looking at what proteins are being uh, translated by the genes at any one moment. So as a one-off, that's not necessarily particularly informative, but after the inflammatory challenge and between the groups of patients could be quite revealing about some of the disease processes, the biological mechanisms that are going on in these complex syndromes. So uh, we found, and this is thanks to my, uh, our PhD student, Marisa Romato, uh, we found it that at baseline between patients with chronic pain and fatigue and controls, the genes expression was completely different. 90% of uh, differentially upregulated genes in patients compared to controls and uh, some downregulated. So the biological processes are, are different. And uh, this, some of this has come up before. One of the interesting biological systems that seem to be different between patients and controls, this is before doing any intervention, it's mitochondrial metabolic processes. Um, then uh, we uh, gave a, looked at the difference between patients and controls um, uh, after the typhoid vaccination, which was the inflammatory challenge, and there were differences in, as you might expect, well, when, when you, across the group, immune processes particularly, but patients compared to controls correcting for, for placebo, this uh, 
NIC NF kappa B signaling pathway, which I'm afraid I am I am not an expert in, but is to do with um, immune processes. Um, okay, sorry. So, how much time do I have? You're, oh, I was on, on the. I was looking at the chat. Oh, you've got a good five. You've got five minutes. Oh, okay. So, <clears throat> in summary, in terms of the the the, the new data that we are um, putting together and hope to publish, soon, is that there are biological mechanisms that relate um, these complex conditions like EDS and MECFS and fibromyalgia uh, to um, uh, altered responsivity to uh, autonomic factors and inflammatory factors. And this will interplay with uh, MCAS and long COVID in some, uh, some patients. And I think uh, that the lessons that we can learn in terms of um, what this means for mental fatigue and brain fog are, are, are the same as we have been hearing earlier in terms of manage what you can treat. So if you suspect it's autonomia, so if, if, um, if, if an orthostatic challenge is inducing brain fog, treat underlying autonomic symptoms. If brain fog is perhaps being caused by mast cell activation, try um, mast cell mediators or low dose naltrexone and, and think, think, because it's so, to me, obviously, so important to think, does this patient have hypermobility? And I'm interested in the broader spectrum of hypermobility than HEDS. Uh, because it, um, it can be so impactful in, in terms of, um, you know, uh, musculoskeletal recovery. I mean, uh, I think that there's an association with hypermobility and asthma, there's and gastro problems and likely with MCAS. And so I think if there are any people in the room who have long COVID research cohorts, I'd love to talk to you about measuring uh, lots of hypermobility related uh, phenomena. Uh, because I think, uh, and Nick uh, really did mention, as did Bethan, how many of these patients have, some of them have diagnosed hypermobility, but in, in our group, only one in five of patients who uh, we found to be hypermobile had ever been told they were hypermobile or thought they were hypermobile. So it is, it is massively overlooked, and I think could be a... Um, a, um, uh, a reason for some of the things that are going on. And why might that be? Uh, so this, um, this doesn't look particularly, um, uh, anyway, sorry. Uh, this is a lower body negative pressure chamber. And uh, probably most people are thinking, what on earth is a lower body negative pressure chamber? But it's a way, it's a way of inducing what it's like to be on a tilt table, but in the brain scanner. And clearly we can't tilt an MRI machine. So this very relatively straightforward device uh, being modeled by an Italian engineer who has made it uh, is, um, is for our brain scanner where we have money from Dysautonomia International to look at multimodal neural correlates of brain fog in postural tachycardia syndrome. And uh, Nick uh, had this fantastic slide. I think it was Nick or it might have been Leslie. Someone did earlier about what um, with all the blood uh, in the wrong part of the body. And we're sort of taught at medical school uh, that the brain auto-regulates and that cerebral perfusion should be, uh, should be um, constant, uh, regardless of your posture. But um, a group of uh, people at Kubrick, the Brain Imaging Centre in Wales, they made one of these chambers and they put healthy controls in the scanner and showed that using arterial spin labeling, cerebral, cerebral perfusion was reduced. So orthostatic stress uh, is probably inducing um, lack of blood flow to the brain, which may well be uh, involved in brain fog. Uh, but that, that's possibly just one mechanism. We did in fact try in the early days of um, long COVID, I was part of a consortium uh, we put in a large long COVID bid to do this in um, long COVID and COVID recovered patients, but unfortunately that was not funded. Uh, but uh, 
Uh, this is an exciting uh, new study, which will we will combine the lower body negative pressure chamber with the brain imaging techniques that look at arterial spin labeling with EEG as well at the same time and near infrared spectroscopy so that we can really get a good handle on what's happening in the brain with an orthostatic challenge. It isn't necessarily just orthostatic challenge though, there's small fiber neuropathy, other things uh, that are going on that um, potentially lead to some of these things. So I've actually sort of talked about this. So the implications for management of brain fog in long COVID and related conditions is each patient is different. I think a personalized approach is required, but if you suspect um, uh, a dysautonomia or MCAS or hypermobility, um, please do as much as you can to treat the underlying, these treatable, well, manageable um, treatment targets to improve um, uh, brain fog. Sorry, I have been quite brain fog last time. Oh, you've done very really well, thank you. <laughs> Awkward. I think it was. I was an early adopter. Now everybody's doing their COVID status. I, know. I was a March 2020 no. super spreader, something like that. That was a so there's no way I could have done this sort of thing. So it's huge. Thank you. Any questions in the audience? I and mean, we know we've been asking you for a lot of questions today. Otherwise, I can go to the so it does look like we're chatting away. I mean, we are looking at the chats and coordinating. I'm not just you know chatting to my mum and looking at Facebook. So no, who else? We're course, here. We are working. Course. So there's been one that's come in. It's talking about when, when talking about long COVID, about post-exertional malaise is not clearly explained, and um, including the necessity to screen for it. Now I'm not sure are you at the right time thinking of brain oh, well to ask because long COVID patient ma management because it changes the management. So should we be more proactive in looking for malaise? I think we absolutely should be looking for malaise, but I think we shouldn't necessarily um, think that there aren't uh, things that we could do to help malaise because of the overlap between MECFS, MCAS and dysautonomia. Think about treating dysautonomia and MCAS in addition to your standard uh, um, commissioned fatigue services. Brilliant. Thank you. Are we any more for any more? We're good, we're good. I think it's getting that close to that. Another cup of coffee time. Thank you very much. That's okay.